Welcome to the Margie and Lisa show. I'm Margie Wigan. This is my co-host. Lisa Jackson. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. And we thought we'd start by just telling you a little bit about why we're doing this and what we're doing. Um, Jim Cousins had an idea for people to be able to call in or email in for community conversation. We think of some issues that are local or national or international. We try to invite guests who can't always come, um, but we appreciate when they do. And we would love to have you join us. So you can call us, you can email, you can Facebook. It's all the information is right there on the screen because we really want to have a community conversation. And it uh, helps us drive our discussion, you know. It's, it's, it's good to have your input and your questions because even if we don't know about it, we might be able to find out information or put you in the right direction so you can understand more about what we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And we do want to have your input as well because we can talk forever, but that's not as fun as having you guys call in. Exactly. So our first topic uh, for tonight is the possibility of having a hotel at the 495 interchange. Um, this was proposed, I think, first in 2013 and, yep. and um, starting to move through channels. Yep. Um, I was talking to Sandy Altamira, who was on the zoning, the Z ZBA, yeah. ZBA uh, one of those, yeah, one of those zoning the zoning things and also planning. <laughs> yeah. And she said that originally the hotel plan was for a big hotel with beautiful meeting rooms and, and uh, restaurant. Right. And so nobody bid on it. No developers came in and wanted to bid on that hotel space. So they m made the plan a little smaller and still nobody bid on it, made the hotel plan smaller, still nobody bid on it. So now we're at the place where um, we're trying to figure out where to put it, but we still don't have any developers right, chiming in to bid on it. Well, and they're looking to change the bylaw from the article I found in October 31st is they do want to change the bylaw to raise it up to four stories. So that's something that's quite different from what Hopkinton normally is. Right. Um, and and it, the footprint, they were talking about because it would make the footprint smaller, mm -hmm. but it would still, oh. but we would still have those high, high rises per se that we don't have really in Hopkinton and that are not zoned for here. So it's, it's kind of an interesting concept. And, and where this proposal will be is at the 495, um, West Main Street inter intersection um, on South Street and then on Elm Street, West Elm Street. Right. So that area, those of you that have driven through there, it's already quite congested and I'm sure people that, you know, developers that want to build hotels, I'm sure have looked at the traffic patterns and things like that. So we wanted to bring it up for discussion and kind of get your feedback as neighbors of the area. Margie and I live on the other side of town, but we still are affected because we drive over here all the time. But, you know, we're just curious about what your thoughts are on it. Yeah, and one, uh, one thing that does affect me or just other people is the fact that the Elmwood School is right, right. there. Because so, you work right there. Right. Yeah. So, but my concern would be we don't know who is in the hotel. Right. Anyone in the hotel could go for a walk. Sure. Two blocks away is a playground full of children. Yeah. Um, so well, that and is hotels a little bit of traditionally are not near Correct. schools. Right. I mean, I travel a lot for work, and right. I, I mean, they're usually in very, you know, industrial areas or you know, business corporation areas, so it's it's not generally. And that area on this side is, I mean, there's the schools there. Right. So that does kind of create, you know, a yep. little bit of a, a worry for, you know, parents and, and Hopkinton residents. Right. And I could see it. <clears throat> um, Scott Richardson, actually, um, who, who has been involved in this, said the whole hotel overlay district includes, like you said, the west part of Elmwood, west side of Lumber Street, the east side of South Street, but only up to Hayward, which is where Co Restaurant is. Yep. And he said he would like to expand the full length to the east side of South Street. Um, but is that again, the Milford line. Yeah, oh, he would okay. like to go all up that, and that makes more sense to me because it's already a business right. industrial zone. Right, EMC's hotel there, there yeah. makes more sense 
Um, well, and, even for the people that would be accessing the hotels. Exactly. I mean, that, that makes much more sense. Right. So people come in for a business trip. They're right next to their hotel, just like right. in downtown Boston. Right. And there is a restaurant there. There is Price Chopper and, and that right. whole complex. Right. So it makes more sense to me to put it up there me because too. having it in a neighborhood that has it's houses. It's residential. Residential. I mean, other than the end. Where, and school district. Yeah. Yeah. So... So that's something that you should be aware of as Hopkinton residents, that right. this is coming before for a zoning change. So that's, right. you know, like why we are bringing this up. And, you know, it does make sense to be on South Street. And that's, you know, certainly of that anywhere. would be the, I mean, when I travel for a conference or whatever, I like to be close to where I'm meeting people or whatever. Sure. So, but to have it on the other side of 495 and really primary a residential area may not make sense. I, I think it does. Um, the other comment that Sandy made, uh, Sandy Altamira, said that um, if we keep expanding and building and, and growing our business to look for revenue positive right. situations, but we're not addressing the traffic right. and the roads, that may be another thing that's not so appealing to hotel sure. owners or businesses. Or, or businesses, yeah. because they're going to want to bring their people into a place that's got lots of viability in terms right. of transportation in terms of restaurants amenities right. ease of uh, you know and uh, really transportation. in Hopkinton, south street makes the most sense yeah. and that's kind of i think how it was developed right. i mean it's it's it, it has it's widened it's it's easier to move around there once you get on this side of 495 it's it's tough right it's it's a tough area so exactly you know we would love to hear your opinion on this yeah. but it just you know when this comes to our eyes we want to bring it forth and and talk about it and I, i'm the four-story building that's pretty high <laughs> i mean not to sound you know you know that i don't like the city i love the city but four stories is actually quite high it is so, it is. I think Elmwood School is two stories. Yep. Um, four stories would be like 40 feet, right? Because yep. it's about 10 foot per story. Yep, or 12, yeah. Yep. So, so that's pretty big. And, and do you know the reasoning behind the having it four floors? Well, just what to is, make the footprint smaller? Yeah, or? that's what it just said. It said it would make the footprint sm stronger, um, s smaller, and then... Let's Would they see. put the restaurant at the top? Is that and have a better view? I or? guess so. I mean, like it, it says, it says a eight thousand square foot minimum, um, and then the fifteen hundred square foot um, function room to like or eight thousand square foot function room. That's pretty big, right? So I guess it would be on the top. I mean, like I don't know. It could be. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just don't know. Yeah, with the plan, but it's odd that we're bringing forth this when we don't actually have any bids for it. Right, We've kind exactly. of changed it around a little bit, but is it, you know, is it something that, you know, is viable? I mean, I've used the Doubletree when I brought speakers in for to come and, and speak to my medical reserve corps, and I've never had a problem getting a hotel room there for speakers or for people like that, and that's literally like exactly. two minutes away. Well, that's away, the thing, you Fortune know. Boulevard has all of those hotels right there are more hotels at the 109 exit off yep. of 495 then we have all the westboro hotels right can so the market bear it I there's mean, I guess that's the question. there's so many hotels in this area i'm just not sure what the point is right um i think there could be other uses if they're trying to fill the vacant right buildings in the elmwood park district right you know, that's the reason for are this. there vacant buildings i believe there? there are some there were some uh -huh. buildings that were empty Gotcha. I don't know now, gotcha. um, but I know some of the buildings. I had seen some articles about those being empty buildings down being there. empty. Um, so I could understand wanting to bring business in. By changing the zoning may open up more exactly business ideas. But that's, you know, I don't know. It, to me, it seems, I don't know, kind of unnecessary, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you, you I know, on, on part of it. I mean, certainly we agree with South Street, but on the other side, Right. It might be a little bit of a challenge. So, and especially you, I, I forget that you're over by the school, so you're really sensitive to that, and kids are walking back and forth, and, right. you know, it's... it's, it's it. And then um, there had been, so I had mentioned that that was my concern. At any time there's a meeting, I stand up and say, I'm concerned because it's near the Elmwood School, yeah. and people say, oh, just put security cameras. Okay, yeah. so we see the perpetrator right. of the crime, <laughs> right? but... 
that doesn't trigger, you know, right. the automatic police response. Right. I just think it's, I, I would like to see more rationale for, like you're saying, why do we need this? Do right. we need this? Right. Let Is us it, know what you think, please. Yeah, um, we, we because, would love to hear what yeah. you guys think about yeah. it because we just wonder why, you know, just what the do zoning Do we need needs. another hotel right. in this area? Right. Do we want it in our backyard? Right. Especially in a residential neighborhood right, right. near a school? Right. I don't and know. And when we have South Street right next door. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, South Street is... Already very Right built there. Up. I mean, literally, was it a quarter of a mile away or maybe a half, depending on where you are on South right. Street, so... And actually, you know, there is no... There really is no walkability from a 495 interchange hotel to the South Street right. businesses, right? Um, so you would you would be concerned with you know, transportation with how, people coming from out and of town, and potentially accidents of people flying off the highway. We do have an email, thank you, Yay. which says why the concern for the people in the hotels, but not a concern for the businesses in town. Good point. Yeah. So a hotel. Oh, so all right. So was this person saying that where we were worried about the businesses being close to the schools and. The, we're not worried about the business, but we're um, worried so about the hotel. So this is saying that, that, there, is that there's a we're... concern for the people in the hotels. The businesses on, on, on the, the area down where they're planning to put the hotel. Right. Why are you not? Well, hotels are very tr transient, so hotels are very. People coming to visit those businesses. True, true. All over the place. In terms of the traffic. No, in terms of the school concerns. Right, the school concerns, the people oh. being there. I think that's oh, what they're asking. Oh, caliper systems, yes. Yeah. So, oh, I see what you're saying. No, I think, you know. Well, I'm, you're right. There are there are people in caliper systems and Perkin Elmer right. that are really close to Elmwood School. You're right. We already have them. So I guess the point is right. let's not bring other people who are transient. Because right. theoretically, people at caliper systems and um, and uh, Perkin Elmer would be right. longstanding standing employees of those companies sure. and even people they come trackable, to meetings or traceable because right. they came in for a meeting whereas hotel could come from anywhere and leave the next day i don't sure. know but, but and that's also a good point. that's a great point but i think almost even from my my point of view too and i think margie's point of view it may belong more on south street just because that's where all the businesses are and, and right. things like that just because of you know, I again, when I've traveled a lot, I've really never had a hotel unless it's like a boutique hotel or something that's kind of tucked away, and those generally aren't four stories high. Um, you know or, what I mean? Or a hut in Fiji on the beach. Right. I, I don't want anything around right. here. Right. So, though, I mean, you know, like I can understand kind of that type of hotel being there mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's in a residential area. Right. But then when you're thinking of a hotel for conferences, sure. I mean, they're generally huge. Lots of people come. You have a big meeting. You know, generally I go to conferences where there's several hundred people or several thousand people and that's when you know hotel like that I mean that's what it seems like a four-story hotel would be for but I mean I don't know what the market number is like how many empty hotel rooms are in the area that's something we look at in emergency preparedness so it's something to kind of find out so as in as in do we would a new hotel even make sense would it be viable view, would it right. yeah would it be viable or, is the or would it be saturated and and would it would the ta would the town give them a tax abatement to have them move here be, which happens with businesses all the time is that really what's right for our community too so there's a right. lot of questions there involved with you know having a new business come into town because there is tax abatements that the the town the community usually gives to have a revenue positive um, right. business come into town and if it's not viable then right is it and actually was, revenue positive i was just going to say that that seems to be the rationale it's revenue positive yeah you know that people coming into the hotel would then use our restaurants right and our uh, our amenities um that we could provide to them right um so i can kind of i'm not sure See both sides. what yeah. the what which way um seems to be more um valuable well, so, so this kind of backs me up to when I was on the Land Use Study Committee when the property came up for sale at Western Nurseries. There were many developers that were interested in the property because they saw it to be revenue, you know, it would be beneficial to their business to make a development there. And I think it's, you know, it's strange to change the, the zoning if we don't even have anybody that's interested mm -hmm. in going through the process. I mean, is it really worth 
the time to make this zoning change if there really isn't viability here. Unless the theory is if they make the four-story zoning, right. maybe that's the change. They're just trying to tweak it right. to see which tweaking right. will attract the, to see the buyer. Right. Because nobody was interested in the big one, nobody was interested in the smaller version or the smaller version than that. Right. So now right. they're saying, well, how can we make it more attractive right. to, to get business in here? But maybe we need to do something completely different. Right. You know? Right. Maybe it needs to be something else than a hotel. Right. I don't right. know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Give us a call, email us, let us know what you think. Right. Right. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, it's an interesting subject and, you know, I really kind of just looked at it today. So I thought it was like, hmm, <laughs> you know, like you look at it and you like try to figure out, you know, from a Hopkinton resident standpoint and, you know, from my background with the land use and, and what I've learned personally traveling, I just thought it was kind of an interesting concept when there wasn't anything that pushed it really. I mean, I, I, I totally believe in bringing revenue to Hopkinton, right. but you know, it really needs to be planned out well and, and make right. sure it's in the best place. I mean, again, like we talked about, South Street is, is a great place for that. Yes, you know? exactly. Because that's already a business zone. Right. So it's not, it, it would make sense to me to put a business right. in the business zone. Right. Not and in if, the residential I mean, school maybe zone. there's room for that. I mean, maybe there's yeah. already land that's there that they can build a hotel there. So if it is viable, why isn't there a hotel there as opposed to on Elm Street? So I guess that's the question we're trying to pose. Yeah. You know, and, and it, again, that's up to the planning board. And But this would come to town meeting. So, right. you know, you as citizens need to be aware of those things that are coming forward and particularly if you live in the area or work in the area, you want to think about, you well, know, what I it think would look it like. I affects, it really affects the whole town mm -hmm. because if you think of, some towns are just bedroom communities and they're just homes. Right. Some towns are more residential, uh, more industrial business like Natick. Yeah. You know, and so Natick has hotels and businesses and a yep. or highway basically running through right. Route 9, running through all <laughs> that Mass Pike. shopping yeah, yeah. zone. We don't want that here. Yeah. They, Natick already has that. Right. So what makes Hopkinton special is the right. land right. and the wealth of trails right. and the hometown feel, small town feel. Right. Harder to have that if right. you have a hotel and all of this growth and, and the huge inflow of cars and traffic right. to the roads that we have. Right. So well, and they've already made modifications over in that area, but it's still, you know, yeah. over on South Street. But Elm right. Street's a little tricky, you know. So I guess, you know, like just looking at it from our point of view, we we wanted to discuss it. Just food for thought. Yeah, food for thought, and um, we wanted your input on this and yeah. look at it, like pay attention and see what's going on and see if this is something you want in your community and um and we could revisit it another time because sure. they are still uh the zoning board is still working on it and um we'll try to get a speaker in and talk about it another time right but right now we're going to take a break yeah yeah thank you yep <laughs> and we'll be back to talk about this year's flu what is predicted and how can we take care of it yep thank you writer, like you've mentioned, um, and honestly, every kid, I mean, my kids that went through summer school, they loved it. They loved their teachers, they loved the building, it's a cute little schoolhouse downtown, but I think we really need this. My name is Kurt. My name is Nina. I'm Gunny. I'm Haley. Hi, hi, David. David. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Alma and Gal, and we love each camp. Hey, I want to be a camp. And I volunteer for HCAM TV. And I watch HCAM TV. And I love HCAM TV. And I love HCAM TV. We love HCAM TV. Woo! So we actually did have a lot of people that were involved. This week on HCAM TV, EHOP presents a spotlight on the town fields. It just was a really nice moment when the kids came out of the woods and were running. Literally, practice stopped and all of the kids. And we're back. 
Welcome back to the Margie and Lisa show. And this second segment is going to be talking about this year's flu, the 2017-2018 yep. flu. Yeah. What are the strains that are out there this year? What's yep. predicted? How do you deal with it? Right. So I'm going to let Lisa start because she this is in her area. area of expertise. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people, I hear a lot of talk about, you know, should I get the flu shot? Um, shouldn't I get the flu shot? Is a risk involved? I mean, for my world, I mean, I work in public health, and, you know, I see nothing, you know, wrong with a flu shot. I think it, it protects so many people. So it's interesting. I haven't actually looked at these numbers in a long time. But, you know, the flu, the flu vaccine, they look at the surveillance. CDC looks at the surveillance. And World Health Organization looks at surveillance at all the strains of um, viruses and flus that are going around. And that's how they develop the vaccine. So the vaccine is always it's usually six month kind of they do that roundabout period they do the southern hemisphere the northern hemisphere and they figure out what vaccine is you know where where are they going to hit the most um virulent strains of the flu and which strain is going to be out there right right and you know we're still dealing with h1n1 and, mm -hmm. and variations of that and you know most of us, I mean, I haven't had the flu in many, 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 many years, and I think mm -hmm. it's because I get the flu vaccine. I get the flu vaccine, too. I wash my hands, yep. and I'm, I'm exposed to kids and people, and I'm all over the place and touching things, and I do really good hand washing. You yep. know, you stay away from people that are sick. But it, it's it's really important to get the flu vaccine, particularly if you're pregnant. Oh yeah. You know, and a lot of people get worried when they're pregnant whether or not to get the flu vaccine. But it was interesting. So, the, why are why are the benefits of the flu vaccine? So people with chronic health problems. You know, if you have an autoimmune disorder, if you have diabetes, if mm -hmm. you have um, heart conditions, if you have anything like that and you are particularly vulnerable to sickness, then, you know, your immune system is deprived a little bit, mm -hmm. then the flu vaccine just gives you that leg up. And all it does is it teaches your immune system how to handle what those to fight. bugs. Yeah, exactly. It teaches you. Exactly. So it teaches your, mm -hmm. your body, like, hey, this is what you may see. Right. And these are how to build these antibodies and build these T cells and get it out of you. Right. So what did you have Yeah, I, I printed out... Um, oh, from the CDC? Yeah, from the mm -hmm. CDC, just... Prevention and control of seasonal influenza with vaccines, recommendations, blah, blah. Yep. Okay, so what it says is um, groups recommended for vaccination would be um, people more than six months. Yeah. So six to 59 months, children six to 59 months, adults um, more over 50 years, Yeah. chronic pulmonary, so lung, mm -hmm. cardiovascular, all kinds of anything, you know, disorder like um, diabetes, any yep. meta metabolic, and it really immunocompromised, like you said. Right. If your immune system is weak, yeah. you need to support it right. and help it fight. Women who will be pregnant or are pregnant, yep. children and adolescents that receive aspirin or salicylate, salicylate <laughs> containing yep. medications, risk for rye syndrome, yep. Yep. Um, residents of nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Sure, when I, I go in to visit my parents, it says if you have a cold or any kind of symptoms, yep. please do not come in. Right. Because right. they don't have immune system. You know, their immune system is low. Right. Um, my parents got the flu vaccine. Yep. They're fine. Um, it also says American Indians and Alaska Natives. Yeah. Maybe they don't have the immunity that, that Europeans. Other, yeah. other Europeans may have. Yeah. Extremely obese people. Yeah. Caregivers and contacts of those at risk. Right. So, and child care providers. Like, you exactly. that take care of young children. Right. And one thing, you know, people should know, um, if it's the first time your child has got a vaccine, they have to get um. two. Mm -hmm. for the booster so that was that's one important thing to think about like of course they have to be over six months if they're under six months make sure you keep that child away from anybody that's sick make mm -hmm. sure you wash your hands and mm -hmm. you know just be really careful vigilant of you know not exposing that infant to to you know the flu mm -hmm. but it's also important for for pregnant women because they actually pass along that uh, the immunization or that ability to fight off the disease 
even after the child is born. Yeah. So that's another really important thing when you're pregnant to get that vaccine. And I, I still hear a lot of people that have fear of what's in the vaccine. I saw something on the news that there was arsenic in the vaccine, and I thought that was... No. Fake news. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, you know? No, it's like, that's bad. <laughs> that's, it's, a, it's unfortunate because I think there's a lot of information out there that that scare people away from the flu vaccine when it's really, it does so many good yeah, things it's, and it saves so more many lives. Than harm. One thing I thought was interesting is that they are not recommending the nasal Not this, this year. year. Nope. Um, and the other thing, um, the, influ with the, the influenza vaccine composition for 1718 mm -hmm. um, has the, they're fighting the A strain, which is Michigan, H1N1. Yeah. They're fighting the A strain Hong Kong flu, yeah. which is the H3N2, and apparently that was one that was very prevalent last year. It was, yeah. And then the Brisbane, which is Australia, yeah. um, 2008-like virus. Yep. Yeah. So Michigan was the one around in 2015, yeah. Hong Kong 2014, um, Brisbane 2008. Yeah. And I just think that's so interesting. Because of the way it mutates and, right. you know, the surveillance. And I think it's so interesting how they figure out what to... Right. And those are those are called the trivalent vaccines. Mm -hmm. And then the quadrivalent vaccines, yep. which have four, yep. four parts, two of them. Um, one of them is a B, and I'm going to pronounce this Phuket, even though it's spelled P-H-U-K-E-T. Yep. And that says Yamagata lineage. That sounds like somewhere out of yeah. Japan. Asian, so, avian. Yeah, yeah, so it's so interesting. Asian, yeah. And they want this to be done by the end of October. So if you didn't get your flu vaccine right. yet, you're a little later than you should right. be. But you can still get it. Right. You know, the height of, and you got to remember, when you get your flu vaccine, it's usually two weeks for you to have Before immunity or some immunity to those diseases. Yeah. You know, it was interesting that... Um, I was looking at statistics and, you know, I work in public health and statistics are only as good as the information you get. Right. So there are certain triggers that you get statistics. So how do you know if someone died of the flu or how do you know if someone is sick from the flu? Most right. of us don't. We may not go to the doctor. The doctor may not report it to DPH, whatever. But the CDC estimates that 9.2 million to 35.6 million illnesses each year are caused by the flu. And even if you if you think about it, not only that it can make turn into pneumonia pneumonia make you quite sick, but it can also, you know, like stop your life. All right. <laughs> make so you, you miserable. So let, you me know? Just, let me just interject here. Yes. That was perfect timing. Yeah. Because we got an email that says, why do I care about the flu? I get sick and I miss a day of work and that's it. <laughs> but you just said yeah. it can turn into pneumonia. pneumonia. It, it depends yep. on what you don't necessarily know what's happening in your immune right. system. Right. And and if you have it before you know you have it, you're contagious. Right. You could pass it along to right. an elderly family member right. or a coworker. Right. So it's a little or bit. Or a child. Or, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say it's irresponsible. Right. Not to get it, but I do think that people sometimes go to work sick. Yeah. And That's pass one things of the along. Main things you shouldn't do. Right. And um, or they they say things like this. Well, what do I care? I'll just stay out of work. Right. Um, and my experience is when you get the flu. Yeah. Which is different from the cold. Right. Is more than one day. You have three to yeah. four or five days <laughs> right. of high fever. Yep. And so you really can't, even if you take aspirin to, or right. Motrin to mask the fever, you're still not right. fully operational. So to be not contagious is you have to not have a fever for 24 hours. Right. So that, you know, and that's what the school districts use. So right. like even if you're masking it with ibuprofen, Tylenol or whatever, um, you can still be contagious and pass it along. And get sicker. Right. Because you're not resting your body in order to fight it off. So it could go somewhere else like pneumonia. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, and every year there's 140,000 to 710,000 hospitalizations. So and do you have a number of deaths? Um, actually, that was is was very interesting because they had a wide range of it. So the deaths were from 12,000 to 56,000. So they had 12,000 deaths. These are actually what they could actually track back 
to the actually influenza. You got to remember they may they would have it had may to have visit, started with yeah. the influenza and they had congestive heart failure or something like mm -hmm. that and it exacerbated what happened. But actual you know tracking it back and to the lineage of the flu. So 2011, 2012 was the 12,000, mm -hmm. and then the high during 2012 and 2013, which was only a year apart, was 56,000. So, you know, like when you look at that, that's still a lot of deaths in our country. So, and that would have been the H3N2? Yep. Yep, the Hong Kong flu. Yeah. I did see I did see something about the Hong Kong flu history, um, which was a pandemic of influenza. Pandemic is an epidemic all over yep. the world. And where we don't have vaccine for it. And right. H1N1 was that, but it was not that virulent. And yeah. We were able to get vaccine for it six months after we saw it, which cool. was a little scary. So this was the pandemic was uh, from 68 to 69, 1968 yep. to 69. First detected in Hong Kong, early 1968, spread to the United States, yep. caused 34,000 deaths. Yeah. And that apparently was the mildest pandemic yep. in the 20th century. 1918, think about after World mm -hmm. War One. Exactly. I mean, literally, it spread through the country and killed, you know, yep. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And this, what they said was, it's possible that fewer people died because the Hong Kong was similar to the Asian flu, yep. which was around from 57 uh, to 68. Yeah. So maybe, maybe having that flu gave them enough immunity. Well, you know, it was interesting during H1N1 is we actually didn't recommend vaccine for H1N1 huh. in 2011 for folks that were born before 65 because they had immunity to that. So the vaccine would not help them, the H1N1 vaccine. From the Asian so, and the Hong Kong. Yeah, so I thought that was also kind of an interesting yeah. thing because those are typically that population are the ones that get the vaccine and we were really looking at six months to 24 year olds because they okay. were highly susceptible susceptible to the H1N1 right. and that that that's why it was so scary we hadn't seen it it came on our radar and that was a pandemic that came out I mean that was considered a pandemic but it the the virus was not very strong it couldn't yeah. live very long in the human body so that's why you know everybody got scared and we we did all the vaccination it was a great drill for public health but you know we were lucky that we dodged a bullet on that one could have been worse it could have been 1918 so, so swine flu yes that's that was H1N1 H1 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 oh, that okay. was H1N1 and yep. what's bird flu avian flu so okay. yeah so it's the Hong Kong and that flu. Affects, yeah yeah so it, it's just the origin of it. So swine flu comes, the origin of it H1 comes M1. from pigs. So, you know, and pigs and humans are very similar genetically. And then avian flu comes from birds. So that's that's the difference. We had, we were looking in public health and preparedness at avian flu a lot in 2006, 2007. I remember that, and dead crows, and you yeah. have to have them tested. Yeah. But did they find transference from the birds to the people? There were minor transferences. Yeah. And the way, the way, how it happened is, was generally people that lived in the homes with the birds, right. and actually by the, the feces drying up and then inhaling a oh. certain amount of it it's almost kind of like legionnaire's disease right um a certain amount Itching. of it they they would get the avian flu from that so that's why you know asia parts of asia right. were very highly affected because a lot of people live in more rural areas and then chickens are in and out of the house or they sleep in areas or where the, the birds are roosting in yeah. the rafters yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly so mm -hmm. you know but that's you know you have to look at that but you know it's Swine flu is a little scarier to me just yeah. because the trans transferability is a little bit quicker and easier and then for humans to. Yeah, yeah. That just made me think about um, uh, the prions and the, you know, the what is the mad cow disease, which oh, is a whole different right. thing. And that was ingestible, so that was a different contact. Um, yep. Do we have a. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, so the other thought I had caller. was. We have a caller. Her name is Linda. Linda. Oh. Hi, Linda. We didn't know Hello. it was a caller. We just had a finger snap, so we didn't know what that meant. Sorry, That's Linda. That's great. We're so happy we you, have Linda? a caller. Yeah. Good. Hey, I wanted to, you guys talking about the flu, and I, um, I'm a pediatrician. I just wanted to highlight how important the vaccine is. Awesome. And yes. How important it is for everybody to get the vaccine and not just rely on the herd immunity. Yes. Perfect. We, is yeah. there anything else you want to say about the, the flu and where you're where your expertise lies in that and um, why people should get it if we missed anything? Uh, yeah, the flu is a nasty, nasty disease. And sometimes it's just like 
really nasty and you're sick for like a week or you know you're sick for a week and then yeah. the next week you're kind of you know still tired and stuff yeah but Angle. every now and then it can be like so so severe you can end up in the hospital with pneumonia or yeah. Yeah. you know even healthy people can once in a while die of the flu so sure. it's really important to get vaccinated yeah. Oh, okay. thank you so much yeah, for you. advocating for that. Cause yeah, I think it's, it. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if you have any more, just call us back or yeah, stay I on sure the line. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and Sorry, Linda, are you. are you still there? Yeah. yeah, I'm here. So the next thing we were going to talk about, maybe you could help with this is, are there things that parents should be doing to prevent flu? Yes. Um, or are there home remedies that they could use if their child does get the flu. I know I do some things, Lisa probably yeah. does, but while we have you, um, hand washing we know is big. Is there anything else people could do to prevent or treat it after kids get it? Well, I mean, going back to the vaccination, so um, if, there, if people get the vaccination, because you know some ba babies can't get it when they're under six months old, so yeah. that's the importance of adults and all the people around them getting it. We call it cocooning making sure that everybody around them is vaccinated. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, sort of what to do if you do think your child or somebody in your family has a flu, yeah. um, you know, just um, keeping them comfortable is sort of the main thing, keeping the fever down. Um, if the fever is making them uncomfortable, which often it's a high fever, so it does. Um, honey for people that are over age one is yeah. okay to do it's actually found to be more effective than most cough medicines yeah. cool. um so honey is really helpful but you can't give that to babies who are under one year old because yeah. there's bacteria um, and hydration i would assume right yeah, yeah we're just actually going to say like the humidifier in the room and drinking yeah. a ton of fluids and just resting sleeping as much as you can really because it is pretty miserable to yeah. have the flu Perfect. It's, it's funny, Thank my you. daughter has me make, and she's 14 now, she's like, Mom, can you make me the homemade cough syrup? And it's it's honey, I boil honey with um, lemon rind and basil or any herbs that I have in the house. Cool. And she'll just yeah, like, spoons of it, good. and she loves it. She's like, she doesn't. And the house must smell wonderful, Yeah, yeah, too, right? she's just like, Mom, can you make me the homemade cough syrup? I'm like, sure, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> But Perfect. It, thank you so much for calling in. We really appreciate yeah, no your input and and your advocating for the flu shot because I think yeah, there's yeah. a lot of information for out there. This up. It's, an, it's an important topic, so thanks for bringing it up. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Awesome. Bye. So in my house, what we try to do is um, I actually think that airborne is a pretty good thing. Oh yeah, because so it has I'm, zinc and vitamin C. All and kinds of immune boosters, mm -hmm. immunity boosters. So if I'm starting to feel a little, you know, maybe scratchy throat, yeah. I do airborne, yep. I drink tea. Um, and Rest then, more. Rest, exactly. Yeah. So, and obviously hand washing all the time. Yeah. Just to prevent it, because I work with kids all day <laughs> you long. You work with little ones, too. And they have all kinds too. of things <laughs> yeah. that, yeah, that they're very sharing with, <laughs> generous they're little with vectors, their germs, yeah. and they cough right in your face. <laughs> yeah. And, but, um, yeah, so, so airborne is great. Um, I think that, you know, trying to stay warm. Mm -hmm. You can't get a cold from being the cold, cold but yeah. being cold lowers your immunity. Yeah, it does. So rest and, and stay warm and yep. stay hydrated. Um, and also, you know, moist air yeah. is helpful. The like she said, yeah. Linda said, a uh, humidifier. Yeah. So. And, and so I hope you guys all get the vaccine. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. vaccine formulation is a little bit different for each person. So you let your, either your public health department or your pharmacy or your doctor decide what the formulation is that's most appropriate for you and your family. And they try to formulate it for the virus that they're predicting. Yeah. The one they're predicting right now is the H3, whatever it's called, H3N4. Yeah. Yep. And they also look at age groups and, and things like that, too. Yeah. So, but thank you. All right. And um, we will be back. Yeah. See you next time. We'll talk about uh, Marathon Mo uh, Museum. Museum. Yeah. Thank you. This week on Business Matters, Tim Kilduff sits down and talks to Nicole St. Pierre of Pro Sports MVP. Nonprofits, corporations. Sure. Uh, nonprofits is one of the major um, sort of um, type of organizations that I deal with. I do a ton with uh, Boy Scouts of America. I've booked probably, I don't know, 100, 150 speakers for about 
25, 30 different councils across the country. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get an $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. This week on The Scene of View, Mary sits down with the Hopkins Historical Society and talks about the history of the town common. ...to come together and, and do their training. And there was one day in May called May Training Day, and I think it varied between towns. And this was a day that all able-bodied men would come to the common and they would do um, exercising arms and trials of marksmanship. And we're back. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to talk about the Marathon Museum which yeah. we are actually really excited about. But yep. we would love to hear your thoughts and comments, so yep. please call in or email us or Facebook us yep. what you think. There's a proposal about bringing a marathon museum to Hockington, which all of us that live here and love the marathon, are, um, I think it's such a wonderful idea. It would, it would have a 200-seat auditorium. Huh? It would have exhibits, it would have event space, race memorabilia, hall of fame, classrooms and more on a 16 acre property. Um, and it looks like it will be off like 85 in between 85 and Wilson. I, I guess that's where we're guessing. Yeah, we're, we're we guessing can't really like tell the, from the description. Right. So if could, you know, please call us. Right. Or email. You, and it sounds like the foundation would be, you know, the 26.2 foundation. Yep. Mm -hmm. They would be the ones that would be funding it, which would be great. Right. And what the article that I have is from the November 9th Hopkinton Independent. Thank you for writing such great articles that we can get information from. Um, called Moving the International Marathon Center Forward, this is written by Michelle Murdoch, talked about the 26.2 Foundation, I believe it's Tim Kildoff, yep. who is the head of that. Executive director, yep. yep. And um, it said that it's private money, absolutely private money, high net worth people, and private corporations. Yeah. So this is not coming from Us. Hopkinton budget at all. Right. But again, in terms of a revenue positive, um, this is positive in many ways. And low impact. Low I mean, impact. Low impact on the community, right? revenue positive. You right. know, and actually Margie and I were talking, they staged the runners um, at Hockington State Park, so this could almost be another staging area for the runners. Right. So that yeah. would be another factor of having that facility there. Although and they would be, it would be closer than Hockington State Park. Yeah, I am still confused about the location because this is saying East Main Street. Right. So East Main would mean, to me, it seems like it would be between... I thought right. Elaine Lazarus said in our last conversation with yeah. her, next to Gracious Retirement Living. Right. So if it's there, you know, and then at one point it was thought to be put into that white house right. next to Western Nurseries by right. the Kiriakides sculpture. Right. So I'm not quite Which sure is where on it's going to be. Route right. Too, you know, Wherever so. it is, Wherever it is, it's going to have history, education, art, literature, media, film, and equipment having to do with the marathon. And Tim, Tim's quote from Tim Kilduff, who couldn't be here tonight with us, unfortunately, said it's different. It's bigger, there's more to the marathon than running 26.2 miles. I believe this community can be the global center for connecting communities using the marathon as a base. And he says, if we don't do it, someone will. Right. This was proposed in 2013, and um, selectmen voted to take action to begin the request for proposal process, which is the RFP. Yep. So it's actually moving. Um, and it's got a lot of support. Parks and Rec is supporting it. Yep. Um, selectmen support it. Um, John Catino's quote, we are endowed with open space, natural resources, facilities, and programs that promote a well-educated and healthy community. So this Marathon Museum fits here. Yeah, perfect. And, yep. and I, for someone that does, um, 
outreach into the community a lot this would also be another community center because it would have an event space that not only things about the marathon but other things that are important to our community this Hmm. would be another space to have community events at you know and i'm quite sure that would be something that would be offered up to the community i don't want to put words in anybody's mouth i'm not sure it may but but you know a lot of times these places and they they become a destination as well you know i mean people you know during the marathon you already see people before and after i i notice our street gets really busy like a month before everybody starts running and and things like that but i think this is a wonderful idea and the specs of it the picture the image of it look it up online it it really is beautiful aesthetically pleasing it's it would be a very nice thing to have in hopkins it's modern it's low yeah so it doesn't it's not obnoxiously right calling attention to itself and interrupting the landscape yeah so it's respectful of the landscape yep um it would have a lot of uh, different parts to it like you were saying sure. there could be meeting spaces i'm not sure if they would go beyond um the sports and the marathon and the right. athletes but you they don't could. know right um and con uh claire wright and um brian her both had comments um affirming this so that the unanimous vote by the selectmen put in in motion the process for establishing the location um I thought that maybe someone mentioned that there might be a um, a YMCA moved over into that area oh, too. Yeah. And we have an email that says, what about putting the museum in center school? That actually was my idea. That's an interesting because idea. Because that that building is so beautiful. It is. With the, the Johnny Kelly, and uh, not Johnny Kelly. The, the statue. Hoyt, yeah. The Hoyt sculpture in front of that. Yeah. It's right on the common. Right. I thought... It's a much smaller space than what it looks like and what they're they're proposing in the 16 acres would be different. But, I mean, certainly if the larger proposal didn't go through, I think, center school, because Celia's like, what are they going to do with center school now that they're opening up the new elementary school? So I think, you know, it is a beautiful building. Right. I had thought of that. But you'd have to gut it. Yeah. You'd have to take out the complete inside of the street. Right, and it might be a tough spot to have a lot of people Traffic. come to because there's not a lot of parking. Right. And, you know, yeah, and because this facility is 16 acres. 16 acres, it's you have your building. auditorium. Would yeah. take up probably an acre at least. Easily, yeah. And then you have 15 more acres of space for exactly. maybe running trails, park area, parking right. lots. And I'm sure they would have Very exciting. Like different, you know, I'm sure they have tracks and things like that that right. would promote running <laughs> right. you know because i think that yeah but I, it, it really looks like a beautiful spot and i'm so happy that we have the marathon here in hoppington and it's it's such a big yeah. part of who we are but so please just, bring your questions you yeah. know and i we love the center school idea and i think yeah. it'll be curious to Good see point. what happens to the center school but i don't know that's another we'll have to talk about that <laughs> I know. we're gonna have to put that <laughs> on our list but um but for the marathon center yeah. I think what's really amazing is, first of all, our town yeah. is where the marathon starts now. It yeah. used to start in Nashville, and they backed it up. Yep. It starts in Hopkinton. Yep. So, so much of the identity of the town oh, sure. has to do, we've got the Walter Brown sculpture that uh, Michael Alfano made right, right, right in the center of town, the starting line. It's beautiful, um, yeah. So there is a lot of our identity, of the Hopkinton right. identity, that has to do with the marathon. Sure. And around the time of the marathon, right. in the middle you know, middle of oh, April, it's... the tour buses come. Right. So now tour buses come, park at the Marathon Museum. Right. Revenue positive. Yeah. Um, they Good for our restaurants, good for our, you know, if we did have hotels, maybe that's a, maybe Maybe that's part of why they're thinking about the hotel, you know, uh, hotels on South Street, my opinion. <laughs> but, Mine too. Yeah, that, that's all right. Um, but anyway, um, you know, if when you're looking at that, I mean, that that would probably drive that hotel business, but it would help our town. It would help our community. It would bring a lot of, well, notor- notoriety, and it would make it more available to more people that are interested in the marathon. Right now, it's kind of a little bit of a tight area for people that actually want to visit us and see what it's about it's a bus that goes downtown to the start line right. you know but wouldn't it be nice to have a, common. a center yeah. right right you know that they could come to and really <laughs> celebrate the marathon so now we have a comment on email 
put a hotel in center school. There we go. <laughs> it could be one of those boutique Downtown, hotels. Yeah, yeah, boutique hotel. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, everything. What a good idea. That is a great idea. That actually. <laughs> I would love to stay. You know, it's funny. Yes. When my mother and I traveled to Idaho, we stay in an idea. old school building that's now a bed and breakfast. It could be a bed and breakfast. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Because so think the, of that idea. In the rooms, they have chalkboards up on the wall, and each of the people that stay in the room write notes oh, to each other. Cute. It's so funny. It's that's in cute. Albion, Idaho, in the middle of nowhere. But but you know what's yeah. interesting about that is historically, that downtown historic district has that beautiful house right there, yeah. the brick long low stone house yes. that's for sale. Used to be an inn because uh. that was the the route that people would the, used to be the horse trail. Right. So it's a historically. And a right place for a hotel. Right. Why don't we make Center School a hotel? That's That's a cool idea. idea. And that, I'm sure, would probably be revenue positive, I would hope. Absolutely. Yeah, so they need to do something with the school. But we would love to have your opinion on this. But I, I, I just love this idea, and I think it would be such a nice thing to have in Hopkinton and I always laugh it is our identity whenever I go anywhere and I'm all over the state all the time where are you from I'm like well I'm from Hopkinton where the Boston Marathon I starts. say the exact yeah, same so thing exactly I'm thing. sure many of you say the same thing so That's you so know funny. it is our identity and it is it's a wonderful identity and you know it's, it's interesting so Hopkinton historically was shoe factories, right? Right. So now it's running shoes. Right. So oh, right? that's right. It just yeah. occurred to me. <laughs> right. So in this marathon museum, right. they would have Hayden Row shoe, shoe examples yeah. of the running shoes, but maybe they should throw a few of the little like you know well, little shoes Hayden Rowe that people all find in their the, chimneys. The cobblers, yeah. Exactly. Well I'm sure the historical society must have because they have all those clothes that's and things what I'm like saying. that. See, it all fits together. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's it's exciting because it is part of our identity. It's going to be revenue positive. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah. I just don't know where it's going to be. Yeah. So if it does go next to Gracious Retirement Living, yeah. sort of in that Western Nurseries zone, yeah. um, which I believe is what Elaine said, then you have the traffic problem. Right. We already have had some, this, although maybe it wouldn't be. Yeah. If same. it's off, if it's back a little ways, if it's on, uh, you know, the Western Nursery property that goes back, you know, even that crossroad, that yeah. would definitely be an easier thing. And you know, I think also just from from a business standpoint, even when the marathon's here, it'd be nice to not have it on the marathon route so it's far enough away and then people could walk over because right. there's not much i mean we live on the marathon route so yeah you know it's like pretty busy there but it, i think it you know if it's off 85 or if it's in a good yeah, facility where people can wherever wherever it's proposed to be i think you know it, it's just going to be such a nice He's thing for a community yeah and the other thing is um People using it, accessing it, would not be using it during commuter times. Right. It would be more like 10 to 2. Right. So that's right. when there is less and traffic. And students would come and kids would come and, right. you know, I Field think. Field trips yeah. from other places, other towns. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, think it really is only a positive. Oh, I don't see any really thing. If you guys have any but negative, you send them our way. <laughs> but yeah. it seems like very, very good. Oh, the know? only thing I can think is, in terms of the aquifer, the more... The more people, right. the more building we do, right. the more uh, water, plumbing resources. is needed. Sure. Um, at which point are we going to have to buy the water back from Ashland right. that we sold? And right. um, that would be the only thing I could think yeah, of. Yeah, and, and what, how that would be handled, how those resources. And then, of course, when you build a big facility like that, you look at where the water runs off and the watershed and things like that. Oh. You know, there's a lot of things to think about when yeah. you build a facility that large. But... You know, I, depending on I, where it is, I think, um, you know, it, it could be quite viable in our community and, and something that I think would kind of be a feather in our cap to have something like that right. here and, right. and really give us an opportunity to promote our community and, and, mm -hmm. and promote the marathon. And much like, um, was it Tim that said they would help us join other yeah. communities together and other, well, the race community is worldwide. You know, mm -hmm. you think people from all over the world come to run the Boston Marathon, so it's an opportunity to right. have events there because it's always in Boston. Right, and I know right now we have a sister relationship with 
sister city with Marathon Greece. Yes. And Tim Kildoff has actually gone there. Has he? To, oh, as he. sort of an ambassador. Um, and Kyriakides has come here um, and talked about, you know, the sculpture and, and his, his background, his connection to marathoning. Yeah. Um, the Kenyan runners visit Elmwood School. Right. As right. you know. So I could see... Kenyan runners having events here. Oh, sure. Because they're, they're coming into town to right. do the Elmwood School event. Yeah. This could be another location for them to to have more people able to meet them and talk with right. them or hear from them than right. just Elmwood School. And learn about what they do. And, I mean, it's an right. incredible sport when you think about it. When you run, I mean, I'm an athlete, but I do not want to run 26.2 miles. I've been at the finish line many times um, oh. with the Medical Reserve Corps, and it's it's very, yeah, you know, it's They're pretty. It's pretty they get there. hard on even the elite runners. I mean, it's 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 truly a marathon when you think of the word. So mm -hmm. it's well, a huge accomplishment. And the person, the original marathon runner, yes, who ran twenty six two point two miles to warn that the that the troops were coming, died. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what it's so from. So is that what the history the guy, is? Sure, there was a battle, and the man ran yeah. all the way from where the battle was to, I believe he ran to Marathon Greece. Uh, no, I don't know. Is that where he the ran word all Marathon the way to comes? warn? Yeah, to warn oh, somebody, and he said, "They're coming. Be careful!" And then he dropped dead because he just ran twenty six point right. two miles. He's dehydrated and his heart totally. failed. Totally. Yeah. That's, so it's it we is have that, yeah. It's a it's a battle of endurance. Yeah. I can't think of any marathon runners who have died. Yeah. But you know when they come through yeah, that really, they some, come yeah. through that finish line and, they, yeah. and people immediately wrap them in a blanket and they mm -hmm. hold them up. Some of them crawl across the finish line. Yeah. It's an exhausting. It is. Exhilarating. Right. Amazing experience all at once. Yep. I do not ever need to do that. Me um, but <laughs> but I I vicariously I have respect for them. Totally. Yeah. I vicariously uh, feel yeah. their exhilaration. I mean, they're just such an accomplishment. Right. You know. And the dedication to the training, the amount of time it takes to train for the marathon. Yeah, and it's a really. It's amazing. just it's it's really an amazing sport, and it's. It's a it, how many thousands of people? I think it was four, almost fourteen thousand that were run ran it this year. Yeah, it was really. Yeah. And does that count all the people that? Not the bandits. No. Yeah. So even but the, the bandits, they've kind of gotten that they, they control it a little better. Yeah, because before <laughs> it was really crazy with the bandits, but I think after the Boston Marathon bombing, it was they got rid of that. So right, and I think the very public. Bendita, yeah, Rosie Ruiz, right, oh, right. Uh, who, who jumped a, on the the tea, the tea at Newton Center and got off at uh, Cleveland Circle <laughs> and was barely breaking a sweat and clearly not in marathon running shape, huffing and puffing and won because she took the tea. <laughs> I forgot she did that. <laughs> yeah, That's so, funny. so they had to, you know, she'll be infinite, out. infamous in forever. Right, that. right, right. That's but now funny. they have the chips and the registration right. and you know I know working. In it's the, an amazing tracking system that it they is. use, too. Yeah. Working in the information booth, yeah. uh, as I have, it, you see the, just all the, you know, they come in, they're exhausted, yeah. they don't know where their number is, yeah. can I borrow, do, I, do you have any, you know, safety pins? Right. Um, oh, right at this end At this right, end of right, it, right, right at the start, you know, I think I lost my chip, just all kinds yeah. of needs and, you know, and they're half asleep when they get there at five o'clock in the right. morning. Right, and they've been time. up, they've been up for a long time and they've had right. to walk or, you know, it's, it's not yep. so easy. And then I can remember Uda Pippig. Yes. Who had, it was her time of the month, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. And she had some, some very loose, yeah just, just digestive situations yeah and she just kept running yeah and her the comment i remember her saying was she just didn't think about that she just thought about winning running. so yeah. she focused on winning right and she was able to overcome all of that physical right. and just forget the sheer what's willpower it's of amazing. it is amazing it's just yeah. absolutely amazing the show world power but yeah. But we we're so happy. I yep. hope this comes to our community and and you support it and if, Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us and please join us. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Have a great evening. Bye.